E aí, gente? Boa tarde, tudo bem? Estamos aí chegando a mais uma semana, eu já parei de contar, de confinamento, de quarentena. É, peguei gosto pela, pelo Ciricutico, pelas lives. Não pretendo parar de fazer, tem sido uma experiência incrível. É, a gente está colocando todas as lives no YouTube, aqui no IGTV e em breve a gente vai transformar as lives em podcast e vão estar disponíveis pelo Spotify. Eu acho que o mais legal das lives é justamente a gente poder é, ouvir, né? Não precisa nem ficar assistindo. Uh, hey, my friend, I see you there, but first I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little brief about who you are in Portuguese and then we turn to English, ok? I'll accept your invitation soon. Hello! Gente, bom, eu tenho hoje um convidado aí incrível, tô... Bom, acho que eu falo isso quase todas as vezes, eu realmente fico muito emocionado com as pessoas que têm topado participar das lives, e hoje eu vou conversar com o Ruri Glynn, que é um amigo já de longa data, eu me lembro que quando eu tava fazendo pesquisa no Nomads, eu era pesquisador do Nomads na USP, financiado pela FAPESP, comecei a estudar arquitetura interativa mais de 10 anos atrás, e eu comecei a ouvir muito falar do Interactive Architecture Lab e um dia eles vieram para o Brasil, trazidos pelo Itaú Cultural, é, para fazer uma exposição. E, eu, e aí eu fiquei super empolgado para descobrir quem era o tal Rory Glynn, imaginando que era um senhor de cabelo branco. E no fim tinha um moleque, tinha um menino assim no canto da, da sala expositiva, era uma instalação que ele trouxe fantástica, chamada Performative Ecologies, e eram uns robôs flutuando no, no, dentro da sala, que tentavam chamar a tua atenção. Eles tinham face recognition, então se você sorria ou se você se assustava, eles respondiam, eram robôs que se movimentavam e produziam luz. E aí tinha esse moleque, e eu fui conversar com ele e descobri que a gente tinha a mesma idade, apaixonados pela, pelo tema da arquitetura interativa, e enfim, a gente já se encontrou diversas vezes, em diversas situações, eu já entrevistei ele outras vezes, mas bom, vou te contar um pouco quem é o Wrigley. É, Rui Glynn é arquiteto e ele tem uma prática intensa como artista de instalações é. interativas. Ele criou e ele dirige o Interactive Architecture Lab na Bartlett Lab, Escola de Arquitetura, é, que faz parte da University College London. Ele vem expondo né, internacionalmente muitos museus, seus trabalhos, como por exemplo o Centro Pompidou, o National Art Museum na China, em Beijing, e a Tate Modern, em Londres, um dos meus museus favoritos no mundo. As instalações interativas dele falam muito sobre esse mundo em que robô e tecnologia se unem à natureza, a natureza se unem aos afetos. Tem uma pesquisa enorme sobre a ciência dos materiais, tecnologias computacionais que exploram as novas estéticas e comportamentos. Nesse cross, né, nessa mistura entre arte, design, arquitetura, tecnologia. É, ele vem trabalhando com diversos institutos como Royal Academy of Arts, o Medical Research Council e a BBC e trabalha para marcas como Twitter, Nike, Arup e Bank of America. Ele organiza bianualmente um evento, um seminário, vale a pena acompanhar, só para citar alguns, o Smart Geometry de 2013, o Fabricate de 2011 e o Digital Hinterlands de 2009. Já publicou dois livros, e é professor associado, é, palestrante na disciplina de Material Futures no curso de Design Industrial da Central St. Martins College em Londres, é, na University of Arts também em Londres, e ele é professor visitante em várias outras escolas na Europa, aquelas escolas que a gente adora, né, quem estuda arquitetura, design e tecnologia, como a ETH de Zurich, a CITA de Copenhagen e a TU Delft. Ok, my friend, now it's time to finally have you here. So we're gonna turn to English. I'm gonna accept your invitation. There you are. Vamos conversar com o Rory Glynn, gente. Muito legal, super empolgado. Espero que seja. Hey, there Hello you are. There. How's it? How are you doing? I'm doing very well, my friend. How are you? Yeah, great. Really great. It's great to see you. It's been, I think it was 2017 I saw you in, in Sao Paulo last, right? So it's, uh, it's always exactly. nice to, to find a, an excuse to talk to you. Exactly, exactly. Is that, that was your, your last time here in Sao Paulo, 2017? Yeah, I had an exhibition at Itaú Cultural 
um, who are from, you know, great friends and a great institution, very supportive of the media art scene. And um, they were kind enough to invite me to join uh, an exhibition there. It was the second time I've shown work there. I think I had my first show in 2008, I think, or 2009. It was like a long time ago. And I think that's where we met, actually. This is where we met. So I, I, I was telling in, in Portuguese how I met you. And I, 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 I remember so clear, I was, I was in love with this installation. I think it was the performative ecologies that you presented yeah. here. And I was hoping to meet this guy who created the Interactive Architecture Lab. And I was searching for, I, I don't know, like a more mature, older guy with white hair. <laughs> and then it was like this, this kid on the corner, like yeah. my age. And I, I mean, this is the very first picture I have in my mind. So now we grew up a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A little bit. Uh, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. It's really good to talk to you. Every time I talk to you, I learn so much. And I had uh, the opportunity and the honor to be interviewing you previously, right? I mean, in London and also in Sao Paulo, we already did two uh, TV shows together as well. And actually, yeah, actually, the last time we met, it was in London. We, we, you, you, you gave me that amazing tour in the new space for the for the Bartlett yes that's right actually yeah I forgot that exactly yeah that was in 2018 I think yeah so um, my friend it's, it's good to see you and I'm I'm, I'm I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about uh, perspectives of the future mm -hmm. and so I want to but I want to start with the present in a let me say let me call it like a micro scale so how was the this moment for you how it's been this moment for you how is your quarantine how it was in the school and in your personal life, how you're dealing with this? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of people are struggling and I can't complain. I feel like I'm very lucky and privileged to be in a situation where I'm personally um, safe and have um, family close by and uh, the university uh, is also a, uh, doing pretty well at UCL uh, with responding to it. I think that different groups of people get hit by this at different times. So some people get hit by it on the first day and other people are affected much further down the line. And I think academia is going to be affected by, oops, I nearly dropped you. Um, I think academia is going to be affected by all of this much later. So I expect towards the end of this year and next year that the true impact the kind of the, almost like the the tremors that follow it will come and affect us in a different sort of way. So we're we've obviously had to switch to online teaching, which is actually um, surprisingly good. I'm enjoying it a lot more. Um, there are some positives to that, which I can talk about. Um, and but there's also negatives. Some of our students are struggling, and we're trying to care for them. Some of them have had to go home. Some of them of their own families have had problems financially and other caused by it. So there's all these un unforeseeable uh, impacts that we're dealing with. I'm definitely busier now, like having to manage this. It's, it's, uh, it's basically turned uh, my life upside down in terms of running a laboratory, but I'm, I'm just happy to be safe and well. And we're still, the course that we run is still running and we're still doing projects. Uh, we had a big project though this year, which got delayed. We were supposed to be exhibiting at the Venice Architecture Biennale this May, but that got pushed back to next year. And um, we were really relieved about that. We were glad that that decision was made because uh, it, it, was, it was very, very difficult to, to complete that project in the conditions that we were facing. So I think things now are actually working out pretty well and I think we're adapting pretty well. So. I think I should be grateful for what we've got. Yes. And how about you? How, how are you getting on with all of this? Okay, yeah, I, I want to give you a little perspective about the situation here. You might be watching some news about Brazil. Well, the situation yeah. here couldn't be worse. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Brazil has this huge inequality. Uh, basically, 50% of the population doesn't have access to basic sanitation. Uh, we have a uh, genocide president, yeah. uh, a, a, a lunatic, anti-democrat president. So this crisis highlighted the situa this horrible, all this horrible situation. Definitely coronavirus is not a democratic virus in Brazil. No. Uh, we know the color of the skin of people that are dying the most. Uh, uh, we know that people are 
that are in vulnerable situation uh, in, in the communities, in the favelas, in the suburbs. So it's it's really it's 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 quite complicated. And again, democracy is is on the edge here. It's on risk. Yeah. So, uh, but also we have some interesting things going on. I'll give you an example as an urbanist and a, an architect. So since uh, we are we were not allowed to go out in the street, we didn't have a, a strict lockdown. But we we quite in São Paulo, for example, we got around 50, 60 percent of the city not going in the street for almost three months. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead, so people are super pissed, are super angry with what's going on concerning democracy, concerning the black genocide that has been mm -hmm. happening in Brazil since ever. But people are not allowed to go on demonstrations in the street. So what's happening is that people are using their windows and the facades of the buildings uh, to make their activism. Mm -hmm. Oops, there we go again. So they are genuinely converting the architecture into interactive architecture somehow there it's it's somehow they transformed the 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 urban scene into a anonymous uh per collective performance which is beautiful yeah. so people go in this in the window with the pens like hitting the pens almost every day around 8 p.m against the president wow. but instead people pro president turn on the radio and play the national hinos or, or, or they use the flags as a nationalist movement. Yeah. We have this very interesting uh, collective happening around Brazil using uh, old projectors and doing mapping projections on the buildings. So we wow. have all over the country a big movement of mapping projection with phrases and images and pictures against Bolsonaro. So it's like the architecture is becoming more and more a very important way of activism here in Brazil. And I think this is fascinating and I, I'm sure you, you think as well. So this is one of the things I really wanted to ask you. What lessons will we take from this moment of everything that is going on, in your opinion, concerning uh, urban, uh, urbanization and concerning architecture? What are the lessons we can, we can get from this? Well, undoubtedly, we, don't, we shouldn't all commute every day. And there's absolutely no reason why everybody has to go to an office every day or everybody has to go to a university every day. It's just becoming completely apparent that that's not necessary. So that will be very interesting how that, I hope, has, a, has an impact on you know, the need, you know, street level traffic, potentially more pedestrianization, more cycle routes. So in London, Major, some of the major streets have been shut down and turned into cycle routes for this period of time because a lot more people are choosing to cycle to work now rather than getting on the tube trains because the tube trains are basically these air sealed, you know, very tightly compacted spaces with lots of people. So they're not really suitable at the moment. So um, I'm hoping that's going to be something that continues. A lot more people are appreciating public space in the city. So people are using their parks a lot more. I'm sure these are like identical scenarios all around the world. One of the things that goes on in London that's quite interesting, and I don't know if you have this issue um, so much in Brazil, but uh, increasingly a lot of our public spaces are actually owned by corporations. So they used to be public spaces, but they've actually been purchased and developed by commercial developers who then use the green space. They effectively present the green space as a park, but actually it's, they can decide whether you go to that park or not. And, and so this then starts to create really strange power imbalances where people think that they have the rights to go to spaces, but actually it's really up to companies, not even the government, whether you're able to use these. And I think right now we're just appreciating just how much public space is essential to uh, well-being. It's essential to the ability for people to convene and protest and all the things that you're talking about. Um, so this is really, this is raising those kinds of, uh, really important issues. Um, and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's also this kind of underlying social issues that I think suddenly the, the light has been shone on the people that keep the city running. So if you've got a list of the most useful and important people, right at that top of that list are people who are doing deliveries, people who are driving trucks, who are cleaning the streets, who are hospitals, nurses, of course, and doctors and so on. You know, and then right down at the bottom of the list are 
possibly, you know, sometimes people like myself, probably artists and designers in, but you know, actually we find that a lot of people who are at the top of the list of the essential people in, in society often are unrecognized, I think are getting a little bit of um, recognition right now. And I hope that that actually does have um, positive impact in policy making down the line. I hope it, it does take, it does shift thinking a little bit away from corporate structures to a kind of community structures and so on and things that you know that I'm curious, I'm, I'm you know, passionate about. So I'm hopeful in, in some ways because you've got to be in these situations. So those, I guess, are the kind of key sort of, sort of socio-political but architectural and urban issues, kind of overlapping issues that I think are coming that are most, you know, those are the big issues that really seem prescient to me right now. I'm curious, I have mixed feelings about what the future holds for us concerning urban space. I mean, I'm, I miss so much going to the street. I mean, I live just nearby Paulist Avenue. And as you know, on Sunday, it becomes an incredible temporary park. So cars are not allowed and it's finally open for people. And then everybody goes and makes picnic and there's band and there's music. So we are, we were living this, this, this Latin American phenomena of occupying uh, reoccupying public spaces and reoccupying the streets in the past 15 years, I would say. Mm. But, but in the other hand, it's a very violent country and there is a lot of issues concerning public spaces. So I am super curious to see how companies, brands, uh, municipality, and, 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 and what's going to happen in, the, in, in public spaces. So I was, mm. I was reading an article recently about London and... I was very excited because this article was, was giving some numbers about how people are biking more and how more bike lanes are being projected in the city. So there is also a perspective for a greener city after the quarantine and possibly new experiments. People seem to be more open to that. And I think this is pretty interesting. So are you living this reality? Are you biking more? Are you seeing? I mean, how's the human reality right now? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I do have a bike. We use it for weekends and things. Actually, uh, my lab is based, um, unfortunately, on the opposite side of London, the actual facility at the moment from where I live. Um, and the reasons for that are because I'm building a house at the moment in on the other side of London. So I'm sort of unable to commute. The trains are, are running, but I, I, I'm not choosing to get on them. But it's a little bit too far to cycle. Like London's a big city, just like Sao Paulo. You know, there's, there's a limit to my... Uh... Way and so on. So it's not just about bicycles sharing streets. It's actually bicycles getting their own dedicated um, uh, pathways to run on. So we're no, by no means, we're nowhere close to Amsterdam and other places that have un who understood this much much earlier. But things are definitely going in the right direction, um, and I'm very, you know, I'm really pleased about that. And yeah, I think actually at the moment. When the, um, when the shutdown happened, one of the key industries that was a uh, key shopping um, um, supplies that was allowed to stay open was actually bicycles. And so cycles, bic uh, bicycles have been selling quicker than ever. And, um, you know, I think that's fantastic. I think that the culture of cycling is only going to increase in this country and, and around the world. So, yeah, I think that's wonderful. That's really one of the strongest positives I think I can, you know, local positives I can take from this for sure. So we are, maybe we are more open for new experiments and maybe this is the chance, right? Uh, I, you, you, you said something to me in an interview we did in 2016 and I was watching today and you said something, you said technology can enslave us, but, but it also can set us free. So it's been four years. I want to know more. I mean, have you been thinking about how uh, the technologies you've been researching? Because, I mean, Interactive Architecture Lab is in the edge of the experimentation concerning new devices, new technologies, but more, much more concerning new ideas, new concepts. Uh, you guys put together in the same table artists, architects, scientists, I think it's one of the most uh, creative atmospheres I've noticed. 
in my in my in my visits outside Brazil. So, how are you guys thinking in the lab and in the university the possibility to of, of technology to set us free, and especially now after the crisis? Have you thinking about it? How? Yeah, it's never too far away from my thoughts. I so. I think education, I should add to that, also, I think, sets you free. And then, and so, uh, I guess, teaching people about technology and how you can create new experiences and how you can take control or you can mediate your experience of the world through technologies is, is what we're driven by. So the master's program and the PhD program we have is training people to not see technology as a black box, but actually something you can open up and start to manipulate and hack and build your own technologies out of. Um, and, I, and I think when I was talking to you at that point, we were talking a little bit about open source communities. And I feel very strongly about uh, the importance of open source communities. And for anybody who's listening, who's not kind of familiar with what I mean by that, effectively, these are communities of developers who, whether they're developing software or hardware, are actually sharing their code. They're effectively inviting other people to take it and use it, misuse it, break it, put it back together again in a different way, mix it up with other things that they have. And effectively, everybody sort of stands on each other's shoulders. And it's, it's a kind of very, um, you know, some people might kind of look at it as a bit of a kind of hippie attitude towards um, technology. Um, but actually, some of the most important technological developments we've had in the last 40 years have actually come from open source communities. I mean, you know, if you look at Unix and Linux and effectively all of the servers that are driving the internet are running on an open source software platform. And um, so it really is at the heart of the internet, um, database software as well. There's so many examples I could go into, but specifically in the world of design, um, we use a set of tools uh, on a daily basis, whether it's um, things like processing or Arduino. And these are basically platforms to allow designers to work creatively with technology. Uh, and what, what we've, and thanks to these amazing communities that develop these tools and share the effectively the, uh, what, uh, not, just this, not just the piece of software, but actually how it works and, and how people can manipulate it. Uh, these amazing communities grow around them, huge support, you know, a great sense of kind of, this great group project to make the world better through technology. And that sounds a little bit like, almost a bit like um, something that might come out of a kind of Californian sort of VP talking about some, you know, about the, you know, San Francisco's um, kind of um, Silicon Valley scene, but I don't mean it like that. I mean it much more about much more distributed creative practices that are happening in every corner of the planet. It could be happening in Delhi. It could be happening in, happening in Shenzhen. It could be happening in sub-Saharan Africa or the UK or wherever, where these tools are cheap. Um, they're not proprietary, which means that you, you're not worried about using them and getting you know, caught for IP or uh, other tricks that kind of corporate technological companies might uh, turn on you. Effectively, these open source tools democratize the use of technology and they allow us all to be able to contribute new ideas about how we should live our lives, how technology should be part of our lives. And that's the freedom element of it that, that drives me. There's this idea that more, the more that we can educate people, the more that we can open up these tools, um, the more freedom and power we have as individuals in our lives and the less, say, you know, the Apples and Amazons and other people of the world. And I acknowledge that I'm using an Apple phone right now and, and it's not that I'm not using these tools, but the idea that these are not the only possible providers of services, but we can actually invent our own um, or we can hack theirs as well, which I'm also interested in. You made me think great. You, you made me think about two special things. So I remember when you came here to Brazil uh, to give a workshop at the, at, the, at the Fab Labs in Sao Paulo. So mm -hmm. at that time, we had a lot of investment in the, uh, in the Fab Labs as a public network of knowledge in technology. And again, as we live in one of the most unequal uh, countries <clears throat> in the planet, we know how important it is to talk about the education, uh, the digital education, because the less 
digital educated uh, we are, the bigger it's going to be the difference between rich and poor. And I remember you were fighting here somehow uh, against it and teaching and, and, and trying to share the knowledge. And I want, how was your experience when you worked in Brazil with, I mean, a different communities with a different social background? How and what was the difference? I mean, what did you see? Yeah, that was brilliant. That was such an amazing experience for myself and my students. And um, we had multiple workshops and, and interactions with different communities while we were actually uh, in Brazil. We were first in Rio. We did a project, we did a workshop. We did four workshops simultaneously at the Museum of the Future. Um, um, and um, we were working a lot with students, university students from uh, uh, university. Un UFRJ, I guess, is the, uni the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, so that was kind of at a, a, at a graduate level. So we were looking at what the, a young sort of graduates were looking like coming out of Brazil. That was super vibrant and we were really well supported there by the museum. And then we had this, but it was, you know, kind of air conditioned, very super high tech environment there. And then we had this completely opposite experience when we got to Sao Paulo, where we were basically in this very simple building this fab lab, I can't remember the name of the park that we, where we were in, but it was, um, do you remember? It was it somewhere was, south. It was the, it was the I, if, I, if I'm not wrong, it was the Butantan, if I'm not wrong, or the Jockey. The jockey ah, Jockey, where, that's right, yeah. that, that rings a bell, exactly. So we were just like in this completely different environment. We opened up the call to people from like all sorts of backgrounds, local communities, some students also from FAO USB. And it was just this great, strange collection of different people from different backgrounds and we were just making these um, little interventions in the park so we actually built all these devices that actually we took out and we placed in like the lake we placed them in the trees and we just built I guess all these little kind of like artificial creatures that were living around the park and interacting with the public and people were just entering into the park and like encountering some strange little robotic creature hanging from a tree and they were like what the hell's going on so it was just really fun and we just shared a bunch of tools and i just you know it's i can't measure the success of that but we enjoyed you know in terms of the impact of it but in terms of uh the time we had and the, the, the conversations we had we had such a fun time and we got to see you as well but um yeah i you know i hope that some of the people who are at that workshop have taken that on in in in, in their studies or in in their own lives as well um, so I don't know how those Fab Labs are going, but I mean, the Fab Lab community is such a strong part of the London hacker digital scene. What, what's going on in Sao Paulo and elsewhere with the Fab Lab scene now that you've had a bit of a change of government? Yes, well, uh, the new government, uh, 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 it's demounting. I mean, it's, 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 education is not a priority, let's, let, let's say. So we have a huge issue concerning culture, arts and education. These are definitely not the the flags that the government are holding up. So they are taking money, there's less people interested. I mean, they are demounting, they are... Mm. But I think the community is super strong. You know, we have, yeah. I mean, Brazilian, uh, the hackers, Brazilian, uh, the hackers and the Brazilian community, it's super strong and super interested. So it's also this community that is fighting a lot using digital ways and using net, uh, digital networks and, and social networks to right. fight and trying to organize uh, against this, 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 this horrible uh, situation right now. So I remember that, so one of the, the I mean, the special meanings or, or the very important meanings of the Fab Labs is sharing this digital knowledge. So somehow it's less about the technology, but it's and, and more about the education and more about the thoughts and more about the ideas and the concepts. And I remember in your workshop, I think there was pretty much this idea of making extraordinary things with ordinary stuff. So not necessarily super expensive gadgets or technologies, but converting to some uh, great ideas. So right now during the Corona, I think it, we, we saw a lot of, uh, it was on TV, it was everywhere, uh, fab labs and maker spaces uh, working hard to 3D print masks or to 3D print uh, uh, machines, uh, like brief machines and so on. 
So I think that maybe there was, this was one of the biggest chances and opportunities to make the subject of the importance of Fab Labs and Makerspace into, the, into a bigger audience. In Brazil, we, it was on TV all the time. And that's probably the first time my mom saw, my grandmother saw, and many people saw a uh, like deep discussion about the Fantastic. ways and, op and opportunities, right? How right. do you feel that? Well, I mean, that's, that, that gets back to this point about power where effectively local communities can build what they want when they want it, right? And it could be anything. It could be, I mean, it's something very serious like masks and protection equipment, but it could also be, you know, something for having a party. You know, it could be something for like modifying your home. It, it doesn't matter what it is, but the point is, is that you can do it and that you don't actually have to rely on other people to make it for you. And I, there's certainly a realization about the enormous amount of power that has been handed to certain countries um, to basically manufacture everything in the world uh, in many respects. Um, and, 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 and effectively, when, when situations like this happen, that you as a country don't have any capacity of your own to be able to be resilient and to respond to that, I think actually something I also mentioned to you uh, when last time we spoke was about this idea of resilience, that um, ecologies are, uh, a, a, a healthy ecology has lots of species in it, right? And uh, what happens as you, uh, and then this is kind of a capitalist sort of imperative, as you sort of simplify and simplify the means of production and the modes of production. So you send all of the production of cars to one place or you send all of the production of medicine to another place. Effectively, you end up with everybody or every country maybe doing a particular role. So maybe the UK is very good at architecture, design, cultural industries. It's good at services maybe or banking, but it's not very good anymore at manufacturing um, like it used to be. Um, and, you know, I'm sure every country has these stories where they've effectively handed over certain parts of their kind of their national, you know, culture of production to other places in return for, you know, optimizing, you know, global production. It works really well in, in some respects until you have a crisis and then these things fall to pieces. And in the same sort of, you know, you can see this in sort of natural um, ecosystems as well. If you've got lots of diversity and something happens, those ecosystems survive. If they become... Uh, if, the, if the diversity decreases, your, ability, your resilience decreases alongside that diversity and things fall to pieces. And I'm kind of arguing that in design, in architecture, in digital media, we need to have diversity in design thinking and production. And, that, and that's the role of open source communities. That's the role of education is to en enable lots and lots of different people to make things mm -hmm. so that we have greater resilience. And I think this story about the Fab Labs right now is, is a beautiful one. It's a really inspiring one. And, and, and maybe in some ways it helps to protect the Fab Labs from other powers right now. So that's fantastic news. But it's not just about making PPE. It's actually about making all sorts of things that we use in our daily lives as well. So uh, I think that's something we have to all work to protect and to kind of maintain this um, diversity. Um, and I think, and again, this is me being an optimist, I think that there will be that this understanding will reach um, policy making. And, you know, it's certainly something that people are much more conscious now of the UK. There's a lot of conversations about um, medicine production right now, PPE production, um, you know, ventilators and so on. And, and that, that kind of that realization, I hope, will also impact the way that we think about the design of our telephone networks. Right, which at the moment are either designed by the US or China, or which is, you know, both of them have, <laughs> I'm worried about both countries making my telephone networks mm -hmm. um, and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so I think there's, I hope that the, what's happening right now can, can catalyze, can create a sort of global phenomena of distribution of production and invention with technology. Incredible. I was, uh, so you, you are talking about your house so you're, you're developing a house. Uh, I'm also doing my apartment. So I'm, 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 I'm living this moment where you are your own client. And of course, you want to experiment many ideas. I'm curious to see how your house is going to end up. The last memory I have 
from your house. It was this big party with a rock and roll band and a lot of drinks. So this is the last <laughs> thing I had from your apartment. Yeah. yeah. Your house. Well, do you think this Corona crisis and all the time you had to spend on your quarantine with your wife and in your own apartment, in your house, did it affect it, your project? Did you change something in your project? Are you I think thinking changed... more about, about house and, I mean, spending so mm. much time there? So, yeah, so in, my, in, in terms of my own house, I mean, I, I kind of have two houses that I'm responsible for, I think, which is I have my, the house I'm building and I think I have this lab which, and, and all of the students who live inside of it and the staff who's sort of this other building that I'm constantly having to kind of rebuild. But, you know, my own house, um, we're building a basement in it and the, and the reason for building that basement is effectively to build a studio in it so that we'll be able to make work from home and be much more sort of uh, autonomous. And I think this was a plan of mine for a very long time um, probably every man wants to make their man cave and maybe that was my original motivation for doing this basement but actually now it's like oh wow we can actually you know we're doing Venice Biennale next year we'll hopefully be able to build that now in at home rather than um, at, at studios so I'm I feel like having that bit of space in the house for production is is such an amazing thing that I'm really looking forward to having but the other, you know, house I'm responsible for, this, this, this lab, um, this kind of virtual house now, we have members all over the planet. Um, we have about 45 students. We have about 15 staff. We have PhD students as well. And we have a community around it as well that we're collaborating with. Um, that, that's definitely somewhere where I thought a lot about um, Lo local interaction and remote interaction because half my students are now in uh they, they could be either they could be five or six hours no more than that maybe seven or eight hours east or west of me uh at any one time uh, and so we have to we had to kind of reinvent a lot of the things that we do um and we're having to reinvent and rethink ways that we're going to be teaching in the future but some of these things are really good lessons and, and things that we're really, really happy with. So probably the thing that stands out for me the most is, is that because we were lucky enough to be in London, we would spend a lot of our time talking to other people in London about what they're doing. And we would invite the London design scene to come and speak to our students. Um, but because we can't even get our neighbors to come and speak to our students now, we've actually been having our most international lecture series we've ever had inviting people from all around the world. And I actually need to get you to come and do a talk at our next lecture series as well, but we'll leave that conversation for a later day. Um, so we're having a much more international lecture series, which is fantastic. So we're feeling a lot more connected in some ways to a kind of global design scene. Um, and our students are also in some, so that's one really huge benefit. And we're almost having a lecture almost every day now with somebody working somewhere on the planet. So. There's a, there's a sense of kind of global discourse going on. We've stopped looking inwards at what we're doing and we're looking a lot more outwards. And I guess even things like you organizing this are another example of this sense of us all taking a moment to breathe and like speak to each other over, you know, gra you know great distances and um, reflect on where we're going. And actually that's something that we never seem to have time to in our daily life. So the, you know, the other thing that's been interesting is our students, um, not being able to work at the moment at our facilities, although we're hoping to get them back soon to, to the Bartlett. The other thing that's been amazing is our students are starting to work with local fabricators and you know, working much more locally to where they're from and learning about the kind of um, tools and communities that are around them that maybe they didn't even realize they were interested in until they came to us in London. And now they've gone back, say, to Taiwan. And they're like, oh, my God, at the end of the street is this amazing 3D printing company or this amazing like um, fab lab or whatever that's in the community and suddenly they're connecting much more locally to what's going on so I'm, I'm kind of excited about that um, and this is certainly proving the the idea that we can collaborate over distance pretty effectively so I'm also hopeful that that means that with the, the, looking forward into the future we'll be much we'll be working much more globally without actually having to do all the horrible traveling 
that you know when you're a, when you're a young man and somebody invites you to go to and do a lecture in you know Turkey or you know the US you're super excited about it but having done a lot of that traveling the idea that we can just have this chat like this right now is just so nice and that you know um I'm kind of appalled to think that I once got invited and flew all the way to New Zealand to give a keynote lecture at a conference it's kind of it's horrendous to imagine that I did that, but it was kind of, you didn't even think like, oh, that's, that's a ridiculous thing to do. I'll fly 28 hours to go and give a talk. But now I don't think any of that will ever happen again. I think business, business class, business flights, that's going to be, I mean, that's, I think that must be all over, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I hope so. So a lot of these things I think are, are exciting and it's just changing the shape of, it's changing what we think is possible. And I really do believe actually this kind of very local networked way of working is extremely exciting and has huge potential to improve the way that we work and to foster very different types of interactions. Um, and, and, and so I'm very optimistic about that. It might mean we finally get a chance to collaborate, Guto, on something. Now that, finally, yes. You know, we've, we've you know. For so long. I'm yeah, right. I'm excited to hear you talking about it because I'm also thinking how, I mean, this, this, this crisis accelerated so many processes, so many virtual ways of collaborating. And as you said, concerning education, concerning, I'll give you an example, my clients. I mean, we don't need to make all of that physical uh, uh, meetings anymore. I mean, I've been working, I have, we, we have, we are around 25 people in the studio right now, and we are not seeing each other for three months now, and it's working. We've been yeah. working actually a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on in the studio. We are not meeting. Of course, we miss because there's a very social uh, connection when you're together and there's a creative energy when we are together. So it makes some, some parts easier. But concerning education and clients and, and so much more and, and indeed this opportunity of collaborating more with people from other places, that's super exciting. So if... You, I know that there is also a big community of Brazilian creatives that uh, watch this live later or, or listen to us later. How the Brazilian uh, students and the Brazilian uh, creative can participate in this new project? There is, is there a name of this new project, this new house that we're talking about? <laughs> which, which house? Are we talking about the metaphorical house of the lab now? Yeah. Um, so, so the, yeah, well, the interactive architecture lab um, which is based at University College London um, and has, you know, um, has students actually now all over the planet who've actually gone back to all sorts of corners of it. Um, uh, you know, I think is, is doing things in, all, in, in, in many, many different parts of the world and, and, and maybe there are ways to connect people with those more local to them. We had a really phenomenal project a few years ago from a guy called Daniello uh, Sampaio who did this project called Hortima Machina B or the Re-Earth Project, which was this massive spherical robot garden that was uh, driving around um, London. Um, so we've had some pretty amazing Brazilian students uh, come, to, come to London to study with us. We have a great guy right now called uh, Bernardo, who's doing amazing, super minimal visual uh, motion graphics projects, but ex um, experimenting with the, um, the thresholds of uh, visual and auditory perception. It's hard to explain without showing videos, but it's exquisite work. So I've got this, I've always, um, you know, with meeting people like Bernardo and meeting people like Daniello and other Brazilian students, I've, had, I've always had the highest regard actually for Brazilian designers. Uh, it's one of the reasons actually, one of the secret reasons that I came to Brazil those years ago to do those workshops at, um, at a couple of different venues in Rio and in, in Sao Paulo um, was actually because I was secretly hoping that it might attract more Brazilian students to come to London. And we have had some, we've had some Brazilian students since then. Um, so I, I think that there's something really, uh, something just incredibly um, energetic and ambitious uh, about Brazilian culture. Um, in, and design culture. Uh, one of the things I most admire about, I think, Brazilian, Brazilian people and designers that I've met is that they always talk about when they're gonna go home, right? So like, 
you know, you meet some people from some countries and they come to London to study and their plan is to stay or maybe stay in Europe or whatever. But whenever I meet a Brazilian, they're always like, yeah, I'm going to come, I'm going to learn as much as I can, then I'm going to bring it back to Brazil and I'm going to share it with like people in Brazil. And I'm like, I love that. I love the, there's a kind of social uh, kind of um, heart to sort of Brazilian design that's really super strong and I admire that. Um, and also, I mean, I think it must be the mix of all of these different cultures overlapping, but there's just real um, diversity of thought. Uh, and di diversity of aesthetics. I mean, like Brazilian music has like so many different characteristics. And I feel like Brazilian designers also have that kind of, you know, multi-dimensional kind of um, approach to all design. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm, whenever I see a Brazilian name pop up on the applications for our course, I'm always super excited. Like I'm, I'm always optimistic when I see that. So, I, I mean, I, I think, um, Doing stuff even remotely, though, as well, would be really interesting. And also thinking about different ways of, of doing stuff over a distance. Because, you know, one of the things that I'm really aware of is, you know, it's not necessarily always possible or affordable or practical to be able to travel halfway around the planet to study. So I think uh, a challenge for the future, but I don't have an answer for you today, is how do we, how do we also uh, potentially connect remotely and, 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 and do things uh, or share what we're doing um, internationally. So that's something maybe we can think about in the future. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the things that's quite, I mean, just to sort of almost uh, think about the other perspective of this is that there is something really missing right now in education, uh, which is uh, because my students are not in a workshop. And for me, being in the workshop is a really essential part of education because if you just wanna learn about software, you can learn a lot about software online or like, you know, there's a, through these open source communities, a big part of a reason for doing an education is to have proximity to people who are making things and to understand the craft of making, because you can learn to code, I think in front of a computer, but you can't learn how to put things together unless you're like stood next to somebody really who's mechanically working with you. And you can't understand materials till you touch them and you stress them and you see if they bend. Uh, and and this, is such a, this is such a key part of what we do is as a, as, a, as, a, as a program, as a lab, is to teach people how to make things uh, and how to make things at scale. So I think one thing that makes us a little bit different, say from an interaction design program or a product design course, is that we try and build large scale, sort of proto architectural scale projects, whole installations, things that can be inhabited, things that can be put out into the public world. And, um, and so making is still key. And so, you know, I'm glad to say um, that education still needs a site. It still needs a place of work. Um, that although we've discovered this ability to work remotely and it's very, very exciting, there is something essential and important about the time that you can, the time of learning that comes from making things in the space, right? So there's yeah. still a requirement for architecture at yeah, the end of the day, absolutely. right? Which is important, I'm glad to say. Um, and so, you know, ideally, you know, I'm always interested in collaborating internationally, but personally for me teaching, there's such a, a, a really central part of it is this ability to stand around a table and manipulate things and talk about them at one-to-one. -one. Yes, well, what, what, what I love about what you guys are doing at the Interactive Architecture Lab and you in your practice as well, is that you guys are combining like in this beautiful melting pot, science, technology. I know there's a lot of theory, but there's a lot of like hands on the, on, on the project. So uh, technology is a powerful uh, uh, way. I mean, it's, it's a tool, but you guys using the extreme possibilities. And I love being there and seeing all the students, like the 3D printers and the robots. And I know that it's a, it's a combination in between art and architecture. I know you, ha you guys have dance, uh, people from dance companies. So this is the diversity of the ideas that comes all together, especially when you have all these people coming from all over the planet to discuss this, this, this new world and this new world of possibilities. We have, I mean, we have to to close our talk really soon. I just would love to hear, I mean, is there any new, uh, I mean, you, 
you already told some, but is there any new project you would like to share? Some interesting project that is going on in the in the lab or or by yourself that you could share with us? Yeah. So, um, well, we're going to be doing the Venice Architecture Biennale next year. So we're going to be uh, exhibiting their uh, kinetic sculpture that we're really excited about and showing some of our students' work as well, we hope there. Um, I think the, you know, I'm, I'm, when I get off this call, I'm going into a meeting with some of my students about a project to develop a, the first national uh, exhibition of graduate new media art. So we've, in the UK, we've never actually had a, a national org, uh, collection of the leading graduates um, working with this kind of hybrid technology, uh, art and science technology um, field that exists. So we want to make that happen. Um, and so we're, and it doesn't, and nobody's thought of it, and I don't know why. So right now we're just kind of putting plans together to, for a space, um, a, a kind of big warehouse space to be able to build a festival slash exhibition to celebrate all of this exciting work that's going on. So I think those are kind of a couple of things that are going on right now that I'm super excited about. So when that, if we get that, hopefully you'll be able to come and see that. It'd be lovely to, to show you around that. Hopefully, and I would love to show you. We, we, so we, we found finally one of my oldest dreams. Uh, we found a, a, a lab in, inside my studio. So it's a private lab, it's a small lab, but it's been a super intense and beautiful uh, moment. Because finally, I have uh, an incredible computer scientist working with us full time, and recently uh, an artist and a programmer, and it brought us a totally new perspective when we have uh, new projects. Because now we can put on the table uh, these creatives from totally different, uh, bringing their totally different perspectives. Like computer scientists, we recently collaborated with a, with a psychologist. And the more diverse it gets, the deeper yeah. the content it gets and the deeper the discussion with the technology gets as well. So it's been well, really created this moment. I, I think this is where architecture becomes really important in this. And it's, um, you know, some people maybe find it hard to believe that we, you know, I, I teach within a school of architecture, but actually architecture is a fantastic um, sort of platform to invite scientists you know hard scientists to be in the same conversation as artists choreographers you name it because i feel like it's one of those disciplines that if you're coming in from the sciences you feel comfortable that you can make a contribution to it and also of course from the arts that you feel like this is a space that you can contribute to it doesn't i in, you know i've I, it, it doesn't work so well in in other places where for example you get like an artist residency at a scientific faculty or you get a, a resident scientist in an artistic faculty. Because in those situations, I've noticed that when there's an artist in the scientific faculty, that often, that often people will be like, no, oh, there's a strange person over there working with textiles. We're not really sure. It's kind of some strangely funded thing. You know, she might be interesting to go and talk to, or he might be interesting to have a chat with, but you know, don't worry about it. And if you go into the art faculties, they're always like, yeah, but you know, like they don't really understand what I'm talking about. And like, you know, maybe, a, I'm not really sure why I'd want to spend my time trying to make a science out of arts and so on. So these kind of, these contradictions are really, they really struggle when you try and implant art into science or science into art. But architecture is this kind of really fantastic platform for, for making people feel comfortable. And that's why we chose to make this course within a school of architecture uh, and why, why I'm proud to describe my practice as architectural, but you know, but always pushing the boundaries of that. So, you know, we also have, neuro, we, in our team in the lab, we have a neuroscientist, we have a computer scientist, we have a dance choreographer, architects, acoustic engineers, um, a kinetic artist, mechanical engineer. There's, you know, all sorts of different characters. And I, I mean, I think this is where it's going because at the end of the day, the computational tools that we're using are, are actually um, coming together. They're synthesizing. Uh, in a sense, there's a kind of computational fluidity which allows you to sort of cross these boundaries much more easily now than historically, even 10 years ago, you could. I mean, right now, we're all looking at gaming engines as platforms for designing interactive experiences. So, and, and we're also talking about using gaming engines for designing a broadcast system for our lab. 
So, so suddenly now gaming engines, filmmaking, interaction design, potentially experiments in sort of perception space, all of them folding on top of each other in such rich and unexpected ways. It's really exciting and, and, and bewildering, you know, completely, you know, confusing, but it, it makes for, uh, you know, an enjoyable day every day. And uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to be able to be part of that and also enable other people to be able to access that world. I love your excitement when you talk about all this incredible opportunities for the future, because I think this is a, another place that you and me, we also meet in this excitement. Uh, we know that if there is a chance of surviving in the, in the, in, in the near future concerning uh, the climate crisis and so on, I think the only way of, 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 of surviving is through technology. And, you know, I've been fighting a lot that I, 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 I also should say that it's combining love and technology. And this is also something I really like about the projects you guys do at the Interactive Lab, because you're also talking about emotions and how you create opportunities to people being together, looking to the eyes and promote the collectiveness and the community uh, sphere and ideas. So this should be the biggest way of using these new technologies, right? Uh, to remind us that we are humans and we, we must be together and we must fight for this planet somehow. So I'm really excited to, to hear from you and to talk to you. Thank you so much. There's My so pleasure. Much to talk. You I are know. welcome. I would say you're welcome to come to Brazil and I know I'm welcome to come to London, but I think at this moment we should welcome ourselves to be more like this and to create projects and workshops and artistic collaborations and so on with people we, we, we admire and we love from all over the world without necessarily getting a plane and flying all the time, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Still, I, I do still look forward to having a beer with you, like at yes, some point, right? Yes, <laughs> Just to finish, I was also watching this also interview we did for GNT for Global, and I think we were drinking like pounds and beers and beers, and I remember in the end of the the interview I was like okay no more filming I think we're getting it right <laughs> thank you so much Maria Big my pleasure you, my friend take care of yourself and your family be safe and I'll see yeah, you I wish soon. you all the best thank thanks you. a lot ciao ciao